Welcome to Our Own Voice, a partnership in mental health awareness in cooperation with NAMI Wichita and K-Sun Community Radio. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We are the largest grassroots advocacy network for people with mental illness and their family members. With over 800 national affiliates and 13 Kansas affiliates, with NAMI Wichita being one of those 13. We provide awareness, support, education, and advocacy for people affected by mental illness. Our purpose here is to provide a community conversation on KSUN Radio that gives insight into what it's like to live with mental illness. Our intention and hope is that our program will change attitudes, assumptions, and stereotypes about people with mental health conditions, and in so doing, we will stop the stigma associated with mental illness. David is out sick today, so my name is Kara. I am very pleased and proud to be your host today, and I am a person living with a mental illness. I am in recovery for schizoaffective disorder. Like everyone, I struggle with the ups and downs of emotions and the challenges of being fully human. But I'm doing great, and I know I have many gifts to offer my family, friends, and community. Before we get too far into the program, I need to note that we talk about mental health issues on this program. There may be some issues or words that may be troubling or triggering for our listeners. Please practice good self-care and use your own discretion when listening. Let me introduce our technical producer for today, Black Soul. Hello, Soul. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Excellent. Okay. And now, let me introduce our guest for today. It is my pleasure to introduce Coach Potter. Hello. Yeah, hello. How are you today? It's a pleasure uh, being here today. And, and, and anytime we're talking about this particular topic, I'm always uh, all for it. Um, so. We are happy to have you here. It's, uh, I've been looking forward to it since you guys reached out after the KWCH uh, yes. um, piece that was done you know, about a week ago. So, Yes, it's, it's always good to uh, get out there and tell what you're all about. Yeah. Um, let me grab my notes here. I'm a little flustered. <laughs> um, our first question we typically ask is, where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born and raised in Sedan, Kansas, which is in the southeast part of Kansas, down around the Coffill and Independence area. Mm -hmm. A little small town. Uh, My wife and I both grew up there, and that's where I met my wife, who I started calling when I was in seventh grade. So, wow, uh, yeah. So, uh, only girlfriend I ever had, but um, you know, she's been she's been through all the thick and the the thin of of uh, ups and downs of of you know the mental health issues that you know I have had personally, and so. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thankful to have a, a wife that, uh, that gets, you know, kind of this whole situation. Of course. It's so, always good to have yeah. people there, especially with how long. Um, so what high school did you go Sedan to? Sedan High School. Graduated there in 1981. And um, uh, mascot is Sedan Blue Devils. Oh, go Blue Devils. Go Blue Devils. And, and uh, you know, it's... Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke at a conference in Salina, and there were about seven people from Sedan, Kansas, there, mm-hmm. and uh, so it was fun for me to. We took a picture with them and enjoyed the the camaraderie, you know, with them. Uh, once a blue devil, always a blue devil. <laughs> right, right. Um, okay, what is your diagnosis? My diagnosis was severe depression and anxiety, mm-hmm. uh, very high anxiety. And, you know, they never talked about the level of it. I know, you know, we, we can all, I think anybody that has experienced some, any type of anxiety issues can talk about the levels that they feel. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, the only way I describe my anxieties through, you know, being a head basketball coach for 30 years was, uh, as I was going through the depression and then you combine the anxiety and the depression, uh, the only way I can describe how I felt was that every small, issue or problem that you might have in the course of a day felt like it was a hundred times more in my, in my mind. Right. And, uh, so it's the only way I describe it. That's, that's why I describe it when I speak to different aud- audiences as well. And I think many, many people understand that, that have had anxiety, they understand the, uh, you know, kind of what that, they know what it feels like. That's the way I describe it. Hopefully that helps other people understand the description of it. So can I ask, do you have, um, intrusive thoughts? Um, have, what's that? Well, um, for, me, for me, intrusive thoughts is, um, I can only describe it in the way I experience it, which is, oh, uh, my, my family is going somewhere. 
they're going to get in a car crash. They're going to, they're, it's, it's just going to happen. And I cannot stop that thought from happening over and over. When uh, the anxiety was, was at the highest level, I had, you know, all kinds of, you know, different thoughts that, that I'd never had before. And, uh, and I still, you know, I still take medication for anxiety today. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, have I ever had, you know, intrusive thought? Yes. Uh, you know, I think anybody that has, um, I think most people, probably most of the listeners would, would be able to relate to it to at least a small, you know, a small version of it. But many of us, I think, you know, depending on what we're going through and what's happening, uh, that's just a, you know, those are irrational thoughts, but those are real thoughts in our own minds. And uh, uh, that's, you know, so I have had some of those, um, some, you know, now I have ways to cope with those a lot better than I ever used to. Mm-hmm. And uh, maybe we can discuss some of those as we as we go forward you know, today as well. Right. Um, yeah, of course. Sorry. I'm looking at my notes. It's all good. I've, this is my first time. doing. It's this, all so. good. <laughs> um, I I'd like to talk about your, your work, what you do. You started and you started advocacy, uh, after your diagnosis, when were you diagnosed? So I was diagnosed officially, uh, it's almost 15 years ago now, and it was at the beginning of the basketball season. And I, for the for the listeners that don't know, I was a head basketball coach for 30 years, and at that time I was in my 19th season as a head coach and, and, and was at Newman University as the head men's basketball coach there. Mm-hmm. And uh, it started at the beginning of that, you know, when practices started that season, and it took – probably approximately about five and a half to six weeks before I spiraled completely out of control with severe depression. So it's been 15 years ago. Um, my wife and I, we describe it as, um, you know, I've been in remission for 15 years (laughs) and, um, but it's always something I think it's, you know, for the listeners, it's important to understand, uh, all of us have, you know, anybody that has struggles with this type of thing, it's always going to be an ongoing thing that we have to make sure that we maintain. Of course. Um, and, um, you know, that's what we do. We do that, you know, my wife and I, you know, I say my wife and I, but I personally. Well, it's uh, a team effort. It is a team effort, and that's what I was getting ready to say. I mean, when, when one person in the family struggles with something, uh, the entire family uh, is a part of that. And uh, my wife many a time, well, not many times, when we are on the road speaking, she will speak for approximately 10 minutes on the caretaker side of it which is a whole nother, you know, maybe you guys need to do a podcast on that. Maybe my wife could come in and do that. But uh, she's extremely um, open and honest about some of the things that she dealt with and and some of the denial that many people are in when it comes to mental health issues, including myself. Uh, I was in denial for a a long time. And, uh, you know, my wife forced me to go to the doctor. And I'm thankful for that because, you know, when I said I spiraled out of control, Um, you know, I had suicidal thoughts, you know, and, and, um, you know, I've never had thoughts of hurting anybody else. It was only thinking I got to get rid of this problem, this cloud that's over my head and didn't really know how to do that. And, um, you know, so many times, you know, as a man, as a father, as a husband, and at that time as a head coach, obviously, you know, you feel like, you know, you've got to be in a position to be in control all the time. And, um, you know, you know what, we're all broken people. And, um, you know, I wish I would have known before what I know now, but you know, that we're trying to use something that was a uh, fairly negative in our life to, to really impact a lot of other people. So that's why I'm here today too. <laughs> so you, you got into advocacy after, after your, um, I did. Yeah. That was a long answer for not really answering it. Wasn't it? <laughs> um, so after my wife forced me to go to the doctor, um, the story goes like this. When I, I wasn't going to tell anybody. Matter of fact, I told my wife, um, the only people that knew that I was, so I had to be at home for, I missed eight games and 28 practices at the beginning of that basketball season Mm -hmm. because of, again, you know, when my, when my wife finally forced me to go to the doctor, um, they told me, Hey coach, we need to put you on some medications and, uh, and uh, we need to give you a little bit of time off here so those medications can kick in. And one of the things that I might say uh, so that all the listeners will hear this is that, you know, antidepressants take four to six weeks before they fully kick in. So many times when people start taking medication, uh, in some cases they could get worse before they get better. And the doctors told me that, and my wife described it as I did get worse before I got better. But um, so I was at home for almost six weeks, and – getting better. And, and, uh, I, I received an email from, uh, the local sports writer that covered our team at Newman. His name is Jeffrey Parson. 
And uh, he just said, hey, coach, when you get back with your team, I want to be the first one to talk to you about why you haven't been with your team. Um, and so I immediately hit reply. I was only about three weeks into my recovery. I was at home when I checked the emails. I hadn't checked my emails in a long time, but finally the medication was starting to kick in. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I hit reply, and I, and I just said, I'm not talking to you or anybody else, and I sent it, and that's the way it was going to be for me. You know, my wife and my personal family members knew that I was struggling with severe depression. Um, my two assistant coaches knew that I was suffering, and my athletic director, and that was it. Um, I told them not to tell anybody. And I was going to put this in my rearview mirror. So it and that felt was, a little bit like a, like a shameful. Oh, very shameful, very guilty for that I couldn't handle my daily duties. You know, like I had done all my life, and you know, had you know, looking back, had a lot of anxiety prior to that, and probably was in some not probably, looking back was in some mild depression for sure, uh, but nothing that that was obviously severe like I was going through that particular time. So. To, it's a it's a kind of a long story, but what happened when I went back with my team is I felt like I owed it to them to tell them why I hadn't been with them, and um, we were literally on our way to, to Topeka to play Washburn University, my very first game back after being gone for missing eight games and all those practices, and one of my freshmen was up front sitting in the front seat, which we kind of made it a mandatory thing for our freshmen to sit up front if we you know to, <laughs> just to get to know them and just, you know, really talk about life and, you know, help him get acclimated to the college, you know, the college game and that type of thing. And this young man, obviously, I told him everything. I told my team everything that, you know, I tell everybody when I speak. And, and so he knew the whole story about the reporter contacting me. And he said, hey, coach, he said, I think it would be really, really cool thing if you would call that reporter back up and you'd actually talk to him. And uh, it always makes me a little emotional when I say that because, you know, as a freshman in college, it was much more wise than I was who had been, you know, I was 41 years of age at the time. And, and I always tell people there's a, there's a legitimate reason as to why he was so wise. And that's because he had already been through severe depression and anxiety. He so, knew. He got it. He understood it. He also knew that by his coach spreading the word, it could potentially change or save somebody else's life. And um, I called that reporter up. My wife and I actually went home and talked to my wife, and we prayed about it. And we decided it was the right thing to do to tell him, and my life has been completely, you know, changed, you know, for the better ever since that article came out. I mean, people have reached out to me for 15 years uh, that have seen the article. Many people that I didn't even know. You know, we we estimated about over 400 people probably contacted us in the next 48 hours after that article came out, and um, we had no idea that we were going to. You know, I, I didn't know other people suffered like that. I just thought I was the only one that, for the lack of a better way to describe it, thought I was the only head coach that was crazy right. and thought I was the only person that was crazy and couldn't handle my own daily duties. So that's how you got started in that. That's how I got started, and it's been an uh, unbelievable journey ever since. Okay. <laughs> Our own voice is intended to humanize the, uh, the misunderstood, highly stigmatized topic of mental illness by showing that it is possible and common to live well with a mental health condition. This is our own voice on KSUN Community Radio. We are talking with Coach Potter. We are going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Our own voice is brought to you by NAMI. If you would like to learn more about the National Alliance on Mental Illness, the programs we offer, or get involved, please visit NAMI.org. Welcome back to Our Own Voice, a partnership in mental health awareness in cooperation with NAMI Wichita and K-Sun Community Radio. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. To learn more about NAMI Wichita and how you can get involved with the mental health community, contact our message line at 316-686-1373 or email us at info at namiwichita.org. Leave a message and someone will get back to you as soon as possible. You can also visit our web and Facebook pages. Our website is www.namiwichita.org, and our Facebook is facebook.com slash namiwichitaks. NAMI has lots of activities going on from our various classes to meetings. The first Tuesday of the month is our affiliate education meeting at 7 p.m. 
where we often have amazing guest speakers share with us happenings in mental health. On the third Tuesday of the month, we have Ask the Doctor Hour from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., followed by our support groups for those family and persons with a lived experience with mental health. And on the fourth Tuesday, we meet at College Hill United Methodist Church for a care and share support group for those persons and family and friends of those living with mental illness. The first and third Tuesday, our meetings are at 1010 North Main, the same location as Breakthrough Club, and Episcopal Social Services. Again, if you would like to join us or learn more about NAMI Wichita, please contact our message line at 316-686-1373. We would love to hear from you. Let me again note that we talk about mental health issues on this program. There may be some issues or words that may be troubling or triggering for our listeners. Please practice good self-care and use your own discretion when listening. Thank you again, Coach Potter, for joining us. Um, Absolutely. Soul, I think you had a question for Coach Potter. Yes, because we were having a, a very uh, fruitful conversation in the break, so I definitely want to bring that up. Um, I played football. You know, that, yep. that was my background. Um, so one thing I really connected with when you start talking about being a head coach, um, the idea of development with young men that yep. comes through sports. Um, a lot of young men, that's their first real touch of mentorship, right, and seeing somebody as far as a role model outside of their family. Uh, so I was just curious, how do you feel that the culture – that surrounds athletics um, affects the conversation uh, positively or negatively as it relates to mental health for these young men? Well, you know, the culture, and you you and I discussed this in the break, is the culture in the athletic world is we're not going to talk about anything that um, somebody would refer to as soft. Uh, we're not going to talk about something that has to do with our, you know, our, our own feelings because, again, it would show uh, according to our the athletic world anyway, it would show weakness. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what I have learned obviously in the last 15 years is that the only thing that shows weakness really, and I'm speaking for myself here, not for other people, but, but my weakness was I didn't have enough courage at the time to tell somebody I had a problem because of the stigma that we're talking about in the athletic world. And, Mm -hmm. you know, being a, you know, man and a head coach and a father and a husband and all those things, you know, you, um, you're just trying to just suck it up and get through it and uh you know unfortunately you know i think we in the athletic world you know we we send that message of exactly what i just said and that is hey man you just got to tough it up man it's going to be okay you got to get through it and what we don't do is give any type of solution you Mm -hmm. know and what are the solutions you know depending on where you come from soul and and, you know our cultures tell us don't talk about this kind of thing it's the way i grew up too and, uh, and then you get in the athletic world, and I believe it's, it's even worse in the athletic world than yep. in most worlds because of what we just talked about with that toughness side of it. And, and don't get me wrong, there's a place to, there's a place to, to talk about, you know, sucking it up and doing right. what you got to do. Overcoming adversity, When somebody's right. not in a – doesn't have a mental health issue, uh, that overcoming adversity thing, I mean, you know, you know this. Like, there's a time when we need to all just like, you know what, it's time to buck up and go. That mm-hmm. being said – uh, what I don't want to uh, do is is confuse that with what we're talking about today. And what we're talking about today are people that have true struggles and yes. that struggle with, you know, whether it be anxiety or, or uh, you know, depression or, or bipolar or any type of mental health issue. And so uh, that's kind of a long answer, I guess, to, to that question. But I just know how it was in my culture. I want to read something to you real quick that I think relates to our culture, you know, to the athletic world culture. But it also relates to most other people's cultures as well. And uh, this was a quote by a lady by the name of Joanna Litt, and uh, her husband was a lawyer, so we're talking about that culture now. Okay. And people you know, have, a, have a, an opinion of who lawyers are and what they're all about, right? And uh, I think this really sums up kind of what we've been talking about. But unfortunately, her, her husband took his life mm. as a lawyer. And, um, and when they interviewed her, this is what she had to say about her husband and, and the, the culture that he worked in. And this is what she had to say. She says, he worked in a culture where it is shameful to ask for help, shameful to be vulnerable, and shameful not to be perfect. And that that kind of sums up my world uh, for, yeah. for many, many years. You know, like that's not something we can talk about because somebody might think we're weak. And I, all I can say, and I say this when I speak to all the different groups that I do, is that there is strength in getting help. There's strength in getting the kind of help that you need so that you can become the best version of yourself. 
And uh, there's nothing weak about it. And um, as I told you in the break, I'm, I'm pointing the finger back at me. I'm guilty of that. I was guilty of that for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, after going through the severe depression and, and um, you know, continuing to treat this, the depression as well, um, you know, I, I just think that's an important thing for all of us to learn in, in our society is that, you know what, we're all human beings and uh, we're all broken and, and uh, we, we've got to change the game plan as far as how we think and act towards mental health. So Absolutely. And I'm going to turn it back over to your host, but I just wanted to commend you uh, because, like I said, so many times coaches are the first level of mentorship. Yeah. And to be able to open that door for those young men and to let them know it's okay to feel the way you're feeling and to talk about it yep. and to seek that help, uh, that's major. So yep. I really want to commit to that. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Yes, you do very good work. And I would actually like to talk about D2 Up. Yes. Yeah, D2 Up is the name of our company that uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife actually came up with the name. She's the one that has all the brains in the family. <laughs> I can assure you of that. Mm -hmm. But but D2 Up stands for Dedicated to Uncommon Principles. And um, we have, you know, I have four topics that I speak on, but as I told you earlier, 95% of the topics that people ask me to, sp or the topic that people ask me to speak on uh, is the mental health, is my own personal journey with, with severe depression and anxiety. And that's just because it's so prevalent everywhere we go. As I said earlier, we've been in eight, you know, in the fall, we were in eight states in eight weeks and getting ready to come up, you know, getting ready to go on another couple trips here to, right. to uh, out of state as well. And also many in-state trips as well. We want to be in every high school and every college and really in front of everybody that wants to have us to talk about this this very important topic. Uh, but D2Up.org, it's the letter D, the number two, UP.org is our website. And, um, you know, if you need to contact us or, you know, if you have any issues, you know, please go on that website and you know, you'll have our email, our cell phones, all the things you need to need to have in order to get a hold of us. Uh, let, let me ask you this. Have you ever encountered uh, NAMI, National Alliance? On yes. Um, so when I was the head coach at, at Newman University, and I don't, I could not tell you how many years ago this was now, but it was probably, I'd say, 10 or 11, but they asked me to come and speak at uh, their annual convention or their annual meeting that they had mm -hmm. uh, on mental health. And so I actually spoke for NAMI, um, you know, however long ago that was. And then I, there was another event that I went to at some point down the road that it was just a, a much shorter speaking engagement. But just, again, they're, you know, trying to do a phenomenal job of getting the word out there so that people will understand that, that you know, this it's time to change, you know, how we look at the stigma that's attached. Of, of course. So. And I actually am working with Ending the Silence. It's a NAMI program where we uh, talk to high schoolers and young adults who um, – just to kind of tell them that it it is normal if you're suffering and you're not alone and you it, it's kind of to get them to realize that it's not someone's fault that they're suffering Absolutely. from a mental illness. It's chemical imbalance, right. you know, in the brain. And when they told me that, actually, it gave me a lot of peace because, you know, again, I just I just thought, man, I just can't handle my daily duties and what's wrong with me and all the guilt and things that you shame, you know, feeling ashamed that you, you know, you, all those things that you go through. And uh, once you realize that it's a chemical imbalance, it's going to be treated by counseling or, or medication or a combination of both, or or there's different things you can do health wise nowadays too with what you're eating and nutrition and that type of thing. So, um, so many times somebody will say, well, coach, you know, you always talk about your meds. Well, you know what? Medication saved my life. That's, that's what I'll say here. My story is not like everybody's story. What I want to encourage everybody to do is to take the first step to get the kind of help that they need or, or take the first step to get their friend or family member, the kind of help that they need. Right. At the end of the day, I just want them to do what their counselor or doctor tells them to do. Right. Um, so uh, that's what I'm a proponent of. <laughs> that, that's good to be a proponent for that because medication, along with therapy, some people say they don't need therapy, but uh, it, uh, studies have shown that medication along with therapy is a good contributor to recovery. I went to counseling as well uh, those six weeks that I was at home. Um, and, you know, it's um, that's a tough thing sometimes for anybody in the athletic world to say. Since then, though, I've done a lot of things in terms of strategies, uh, working with sports psychologists that, that is a good friend of mine that, you know, just to help you understand and deal with some of the anxieties that we have. So uh, just quickly here, you know, one of the things that, that I was able to do was to jot down all my negative thoughts for one week at the end of the day, just jot them all down. And, and then once you do that and you're able to see the negative thoughts or 
most of the time what you realize is most of them are irrational thoughts. In mm-hmm. other words, they're things that aren't going to even come true, but we worry about them. Right. And if we can recognize in our brain when we're doing that, then we can truly change the course of, we can give ourselves permission not to have to let that bring us down. Sometimes easier said than done. It's something I work on every day. And, um, but it's, a, it's also another important strategy. Once you get the help that you need, that's, those strategies won't work until, if somebody's majorly into the anxiety, has high anxiety or has you know, severe depression or any type of mental health issue, get help for that first. Then the strategies you can start to apply. Um, you know, after you get the kind of help that you need. Thank you. What words of hope can you share with us about those who are living um, with a mental illness? Like maybe to those who don't have a mental illness, who don't understand the kind of world that we come from. Yeah. You know, one of the, you know, it's interesting, you know, my wife, um, my wife works a part-time at a, at a clothing store here in Wichita and she had a customer come in that they knew our story. They knew my story and she, her comment, and she didn't mean anything by it, but her comment was, you know, yeah, those people are a little different. In other words, Mm. in other words, somebody with a mental health Mm -hmm. issue are a little different. And, you know, we all can have, we all have our own story, don't we? I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. anybody that's had any type of issues, we all have our own stories. Well, there's not a human being living on the face of this earth that hadn't had some type of issue. They they may not have gone through severe depression or incredibly high anxiety, but if everybody's honest with themselves, they can look back at a time and say, you know what? Um, There's probably, I probably had some struggles during that time. So here's my point is that there is a, it's very important for other people to understand that somebody that has a mental health issue, you know, I, I, I was a head coach for another, you know, 11 years after I was diagnosed and, you know, I talked about being in remission. Well, um, people, you know, CEOs, businesses, you know, people that are working everyday jobs, whatever that may be, you know, uh, many, many, many people struggle, but they have to understand it's okay to get the kind of help that we need. It's not, you talked about it being normal, you know, Statistics say one out of every four people are going to have some type of uh, annually are going to have some type of mental health issue. That's well, a lot. that's a lot. And, and yet, you know what I've learned in my, especially in the three years that I've full time been out on the road speaking, that's that number is way low. And you know why that is? Because people aren't talking about it. Of people course. aren't going to the doctor. They're not getting that kind of help that they need. So for the people that mm-hmm. may not understand it, um, you know, people that struggle, it, it's just normal. You know, it's it's a normal thing for people to go through. And um, what we're trying to do is just to help people understand, listen, you know, either through the medication or counseling, if it's if it's really at a, at a level that you've got to get help, then you must be able to understand it's okay to get that help. Of course. And, uh, and we can go back to our normal lives. You know, I have a one of my former players is a family physician, and, I, you know, not every family physician has every answer on mental health. I get that. But I asked him this question. I said, for somebody that is treated for a mental health issue, whether it be depression or anxiety, whatever it may be, how many of them, what, what do you think the percentage is that they can go back to their normal life? It's, it's very hard. And, and um, he, he said after they're treated, if they're treated, they can, he said 95% of people can go back to their normal life. And he said the other ones that may have to continue to battle, just he said my encouragement to them would be to keep battling, make sure they continue to find the, either the right medications or counseling, making sure they're going back to their doctor and counselor to find out what it is they've got to continue to do. You know, there is a, there's a lot of different things out there, and we don't have time to go into all of them today, but, you know, there's a swab that you can, you can swab your cheek now and and a very high percentage of the medication that you might need for your chemical imbalance so i say you're i mean talking about anybody that would do that test Mm -hmm. that could potentially really help your that particular person's chemical imbalance so there's a lot of new things on the market now that could really you can really help you know other people that are struggling so coach potter thank you again for being here we are over time but go ahead and tell us your website one more time yeah d2up.org it's the letter d the number two up so d2up.org and, uh, you know, our, our emails and cell phone numbers are on there and, and, uh, you know, reach out if you need something. And, uh, you know, all we care about is that, you know, people understand that, uh, let's attack the stigma together. Let's, let's do it as a, as a society and let's try to figure out a way to change the trajectory of the suicide rate and people that are suffering in silence. You're right. Let's do it. Thank you for joining us on our own voice on KSUN community radio. Thank you to coach Potter for talking with us. 
Join us for our next Our Own Voice program.